obviously I know people are dying from it. By all means, I'm not trying to say this isn't a thing, but unfortunately I could walk outside right now and be hit by a car. So there's risks with everything. There's a lot that's going on. I just think it's a shame how many people are being distanced from their family. Um, you can't see loved ones in the hospital that are dying, not even COVID related. Businesses that are going under, people who are losing their entire life savings because their businesses have been affected by it. That's where I struggle with what is happening with the whole COVID pandemic. I, I'm Tim. I'm I'm here at I, I love being sober. I'm with Whitney Jones, and um, health and fitness is is something that is uh, near and dear to my heart. And being clean and sober, this is for for anybody that um, is early in recovery. They want to get clean and sober. They've been clean and sober for a little while. Um, health and fitness in my experience has been the opposite of addiction and the drinking and the drug use and the selfishness and self-centeredness and the manipulation and the lies and the cheating and the stealing and all the stuff that went <laughs> along with the drinking and the drug use. Um, and and so, so Whitney is a mom of two incredible boys, two times mm -hmm. Miss Fitness Olympia and five times Pro Champ, owner of Pro Physique's gym, owner of the pros online training and prep team, owner of Fearless by Whitney Jones and show promoter of the NPC Whitney Jones Classic. And today, uh, Whitney and I are gonna talk about health and fitness, uh, yes. mistakes people make we're in injuries, because you've had a couple of injuries <laughs> and <laughs> we're, we're gonna yeah. talk about stepping outside of your comfort zone and setting high goals. Uh, we're going to talk about your history with your eating disorder, along with your depression and kind of uh, the, the the trials that you went through and how you were able to get through that. The ch champion mindset, how to be unstoppable when life keeps throwing obstacles at you. And then also just stopping the, the all or nothing mentality and being able to roll with the punches and how you've been able to roll with the punches in your life, which when I hear that, I think about doing the next right thing. I think about taking it one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time. So, mm -hmm. um, and then also we're gonna talk about COVID-19 a little bit. Um, you have a little bit of experience with COVID-19. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> as do I, as do I. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and the, you know, the is it a fake pandemic? Is it a real pandemic? I don't know. But anyways, Whitney, so good to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. I'm loving being here. And we've got some fun stuff to talk about today. Woo! Yes, we do, we do. I'm so, I've, I've been looking forward to this uh, for, for a while. I think we set this up a while ago, over a month ago. So really yeah. good to have you here. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and dive right into kind of your story. So tell me a little bit about, about you and where you came from and, um, and let's just, just kind of go with it. Well, so I'm actually a Southern girl. I was born in Jackson, Mississippi, but moved here when I was young. So kind of claim Arizona. Um, love it here. I can't see myself ever leaving Arizona. Um, and as you mentioned, I have two boys. So I'm a single mom raising two boys. I'm juggling a ton of different things just with the multiple businesses. But I love being active. I love being healthy. I feel like that is something with all the uncertainty in the world and all the things that we can't control. Being healthy and, and kind of diving into my fitness is something I can control. And I feel like in so many aspects, we need something that we can control that's a positive outlet. So I got into that um, years ago. Just again, like growing up as a child, I played every sport I possibly could. And then as an adult, I just needed an outlet, you know, to kind of get stress levels under control and have something outside of work or family that I could have as my kind of go-to. So I ended up starting to compete. Um, I compete in the fitness division. I get to travel the world and kind of step on some amazing stages. And what I do is um, in the realm of bodybuilding, I don't do bodybuilding or flexing or any of that. I do the fitness division where you actually do a two minute routine with dancing, gymnastics, and then of course you have to be in shape too. So that's part of it. 
you know, that's kind of my background and, and where I came from and where I'm at now. Okay. So now let's, let's back up a little bit because you, you mentioned that you had your bouts with your, your eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So tell me, when did, when did your eating disorder start? So it actually, um, I started having the traits, I guess, of an eating disorder in high school and it had nothing to do with how I wanted to look physical appearance or anything, which is very rare. Um, from everything I've learned, because obviously as part of this, it got worse through college, I had to go through rehab, but it actually started because I'm, I'm an athlete and I'm competitive and there was a track meet and I did not feel well before my track meet and I felt sick, like I was gonna throw up. Ended up throwing up, making myself throw up because I just felt awful. And then I had the best time ever in my hurdle race. And I thought, oh, well, that was a reason it happened. So long story short, that's how my eating disorder started. Had nothing to do with the normal reasons why eating disorders start. But of course, as I graduated high school, got into college, that became my go-to in regards to how to control how I can look and started um, body dysmorphia, unhealthy eating habits. And it just, you know, dove me into this horrible place. Um, very depressed. I have depression that runs in my family. And so um, my parents noticed they started catching on to some of the things, bad habits I was doing. And I actually, they had approached me three different occasions. So it was, it was a now, eating disorder that lasted about three years. Now, how did, okay. So would you say that um, like alcoholism and drug addiction is a progressive disease? Would mm -hmm. you say the same thing about your eating disorder? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yep. It's like you, you have your first drink. It's like, oh, that that uh -huh. was kind of nice. That was kind of fun. And then and then next thing you know, you're 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 drinking a case a day and you're drinking yep. and, and you're you're blacking out. And so for you, it was you you purged one time before a race. Mm -hmm. You had your best time ever. And yep. it's like, oh, that was kind yeah. of that was kind of that was kind of nice. That felt yeah. pretty. I mean, you felt pretty good after that. And so. Yeah. That leads to, I mean, I can only imagine like before a test, when you're studying, when you're going out to dinner, when you're going out on a date, when you're going out, like whatever it is that you're doing, yeah. the purging, and then, and then you can also eat whatever you want to eat, right? Exactly. And that's the thing. I hate to say it, but in high school, it's like, okay, this wasn't a normal thing. Like, obviously, I'm making myself throw up for an athletic event. But then you start seeing it in magazines, you start reading stuff online, and it's like, oh, this is a great way to be skinny and you know not gain weight, eat whatever you want. So like I went through this eating disorder process, totally opposite of what most people do. But then it became a way of controlling how I look and felt, which doesn't ever work. I mean, let's be honest, any type of addiction, you're not getting what you're hoping to get out of it. But it just started this slippery slope where I just got deep into an eating disorder where I was starving myself for days. And then if I did eat something, I felt guilty and had to purge. And I was having major health issues. Um, my heart was significantly affected. So by the third time that my parents tried to get me into rehab and, and talking with people, I finally was receptive. I had hit a point where I was like, I don't want to live like this anymore. Yeah. I didn't want to be healed of an eating disorder. I just wanted to stop the pain, the depression, um, the feeling like I was out of control. So I agreed to go into rehab and try to give it my best bet this time. And it actually, um, it worked. It, it helped me pull out of it. It was a long process. It was literally probably about a year where I, you know, felt like I could actually control and overcome it. So it was a very dark time in my life, but I wouldn't change it for the world because some of the lessons that I learned during that time has helped propel me as a person with integrity that I knew I could overcome things that I thought never were possible, that I was stronger, way stronger and capable of more. So experiencing that helped me become the adult that I am today, trying to work and achieve things that just seem impossible because at that point in my life, I thought there's no way I'm ever going to get out of this. I really thought this is a joke. I'm constantly going to relapse. 
but it's just, it, it was really having an open mind to say, no, there's plenty of people in the world who overcome addiction. Why can't I be one of those? Right. And finally, like in my down moments, it was like, no, be the, be the ones that do break through and succeed and overcome this. Don't be, you're either going to go one or two ways. You're either going to actually overcome it or you're actually just going to keep staying in this pit. And so I took it as a challenge, like challenge yourself, yeah. see what you can do. Be one of those people who succeed and get through all these horrible times. Well, and an eating disorder is, I mean, all addictions are tough. Eating dis disorders are very difficult to overcome. And there's so many, I mean, and you have to eat. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. have to eat. So there, there, there's, there's no way of getting around not eating. So you have to eat. And then did you, um, so you went to rehab for what, 30 days or something like that, approximately? Yeah. Uh huh. And then did that a lot of the outpatient for a good solid year, year and a half. Okay. And then how old were you? I was 20. Okay. And then, um, did you, um, did you do any 12 step work? Yes and no. Um, the program was a little bit different. So it was almost like I started that process, but it wasn't the standard or traditional that like I know about now. Right. And so how did you ever, did you ever relapse? So after you went to rehab, did you ever relapse? The third time? No. Um, the first two times I did never, it was more going into um, counseling, open settings. The first two times was more like my outpatient process after I really went through rehab. So I, I relapsed those two times because I don't even think I really bought in to the yeah. concept. It was yeah. like, I'm doing this because my parents are forcing me to. Whereas the third time I was like, you know what? I'm over it. Maybe there is hope. And I didn't relapse after that because once I made significant strides, I knew I don't ever want to go back. I, I realized a happiness. Finally, I was getting back to my old self and I'm like, this is something I have to control. I can daily, hourly, minute by minute, focus on staying on my path to recovery because I saw just that dark side and I knew it was just so easy to get back to there if I don't take control of this. So I was very fortunate the third time um, I didn't, but it's honestly, I can attribute it to, I had an open mind. I didn't have a bad attitude going into it. And right. I truly personally wanted help. I wasn't sold. I wasn't like, yes, take me in. But I, I had that like, maybe I could get help. And I just tried to keep an open mind. And then through, you know, weeks, it was like, okay, no, I can do this. I'm going to get out of this slump and this depressive dark hole. I, I want to have my life back. And I just kept going with it. Yeah. And what, what I'm hearing is that you were open to suggestions. Mm -hmm. you yeah, were open absolutely. To suggestions. You were open to doing the work. You realized yeah. that your best thinking got you where you were. Mm -hmm. right? I was ready to do the hard work. I was ready for the challenge. It was like, I knew it was going to be hard, but I was like, let's, let's do this. Let's try it now. I didn't want to keep repeating this cycle of, oh, let's get healthy. And, you know, I'm like, no, I, I want to do it now. And I'm willing to put in the work. And then after you graduated from college, you got into corporate sales or something like mm -hmm. that, right? Yep. Yeah. I was in marketing. I worked for an ad agency. Um, and huge corporation. So, yep. And that, I mean, that had to have been stressful. Yes. Very, very stressful, actually. Yeah. yeah. That was stressful. And you worked a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. What brought you back to the, okay. So yeah. What brought you back to the, the, the health and fitness focus and what, what you're doing today? Um, well, like you said, I was working for a corporate business and our, I was working myself to the bone. I mean, on obviously it was, it was not, there was no time for um, even trying to get in any exercise, social life, whatever. And I realized, wow, this is, this is taking me down a different path. And through my rehab and after college, I did use exercise as an outlet, just again, for stress relief. Um, whatever it was. So at this job, I was just working so much that I started becoming unhealthy and that unhealthy in 
my mental state, unhealthy physically. So I'm like, I need to change this. And I tried to change it working in the industry I was in and it, it wasn't working out for me. I just still wasn't able to allocate the time. So I actually shifted and got into the health and fitness industry. At that time, um, when I worked at the ad agency, I was training clients out of my house just for fun. Um, but I wasn't even training myself. It was like, I love trying to keep people healthy. But again, everything was devoted to everyone else. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this full time because I loved it. And yeah. it's like, let's just see where it goes. Like I train people for free. Why don't I try to make a business out of it? And so that's where I really propelled into the health and fitness industry. Cause I'm like, how fun would it be to exercise all day and help other people exercise and Got keep it. them motivated? So a lot of the stuff too, like the cheerleading from rehab and having these people who support you and encourage you. I loved that. So I wanted to do that back to others and through coaching and getting into the fitness industry, it was allowing me to kind of give back and help other people. So I found that super fulfilling and I haven't left this industry since. <laughs> right. Well, and it, it's kind of like doing your, your corporate job, which drained you versus helping people and focusing on health, health and fitness, which you're passionate about that energized you. So I can imagine Absolutely. that your your life is much happier as a result of of the choice to to continue helping people on their own journey for sure 100 percent. that's what lights my fire i love it so you, you you talk about um stepping out of your comfort zone and setting high goals what does that what does that mean to you or give me an example of uh of a goal that you set that was so high and it caused you to step outside of your zone. well i again, kind of embrace the whole step out of your comfort zone and try to do something that you think is absolutely crazy through the whole rehab experience. Because again, when I was in that mindset, I thought there is no way I'll ever be happy again. I just could never see the light at the end of the tunnel. But through that whole experience, I realized I can. And it's like, wow, I can be like all these normal people I see walking around, just living life, being happy, laughing. So I learned at that stage of my life, stepping out of your comfort zone is the way you really kind of level up. So when I started getting into the whole health and fitness realm, I understood some of these um, athletes who were competing and doing these competitions and it intrigued me. So I thought, huh, I'll try it. Loved it, did my first little fitness competition. And then it was like, it kind of just sparked me like, huh, maybe one day I'll just keep doing well and keep pursuing it. And maybe I'll turn pro because in our sport, you can turn pro. It's kind of like baseball where you're playing in the minor leagues and you go pro, you are now in the majors. That's kind of how our sport works. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of set these goals. Like I'm going to do these competitions. I'm going to turn pro. I want to step on the Olympia stage, step on the Arnold um, Schwarzenegger stage, meet him, like all these crazy things. And it's like, yeah, right. But sometimes it's like when you create these goals that are so insane that people think you're crazy. To me, I'm always like, that's when I know I'm onto something. Yeah. And you just kind of work towards it. And for me, I I like that where it's not an all or nothing mentality for me. It's it's I'm not going to view myself as a failure if I don't get there because again, these are goals that seem so ridiculous, but I want to shoot for it because I never want to live in that shoulda, woulda, coulda, you know, it's like, yeah. I don't want that. What if, what if I would have tried that? We're not getting younger, so you might as well try. So for me, I set a goal to be number one in the world. And as an amateur in this whole sport, it's like, you're nuts. Like that is so rare. And people achieve that who have been in this fitness industry since they were literally little kids. And that was not my case. I, um, got started in this industry when I was 32 years old, which is a lot older than the average person to ever get into it. But I was like, I'm gonna do it. And long story short, I actually achieved that. Um, I've been two time Miss Fitness Olympia, which is number one in the world. And um, it was an incredible ride to get there. But the thing was, I just had gratitude. I was grateful for every opportunity that I was able to compete. Um, I was proud of my accomplishments through the journey getting to the show and wasn't so worried about the outcome. It's right. like if I can step off stage and say, I did everything I was supposed to, I nailed my performance, I hit all my skills, 
face plant on the back pad. Um, yeah. The physique looks great. Then I'm winning. And I took all the pressure off. And I honestly attribute that to being how I was able to get to the top because I was enjoying the ride and I was grateful and thankful and I was proud of all the little things and never focused on the result, never focused on the outcome because that's out of my control. It's a subjective sport. The judges could like me, they could not, they could hate my performance, they could love it. All I can control is what I bring to the table, um, the performance I put on, and as long as I'm happy, then I've won. So it was a very fulfilling experience because either way, I was winning in my mind. Now, granted, actually winning the title is really kind of cool thing, but that's probably the biggest thing that I really said, I'm going to achieve this and thought, this is crazy. <laughs> that's, that's such an amazing thing. I mean, you, you, you were Miss Fitness Olympia 2018, 2019 and third place here in 2020, right? Which yes, is, uh -huh. is no small feat. I mean, that's such an right. amazing accomplishment. Um, I, I listened to uh, an interview with Tim Ferriss and Jim Lear. I think that's how you say his name on mental mental toughness and energy management. And he talked about a an ice skater. I forgot his name, but um, this was a guy that was like the best speed skater of all time. But he didn't have an Olympic medal, and he mm -hmm. hated he hated the thousand the thousand meter sprint or it's not a sprint, but it's a thousand meters. And he started in, in, in Jim Lears talked to him about journaling and saying, I love the thousand meters. I love the thousand meters. It's my, the thousand meters is my favorite. And he said, I know you hate the thousand meters, but let's change your mindset. And I think that's mm -hmm. along the same lines as what you're saying. It's like set goals that are so high, that are so ridiculous. It doesn't really matter what the outcome is. It doesn't really right. matter if you achieve the goal or not. As long as you do your very best, then you can feel yep. good about the effort that you put forth. And if you win, awesome, right? Right, exactly. And if you don't, you should still be proud if you've done the work to get there. Absolutely. Right. I think there's uh, someone else I was, uh, another interview I was listening to, I think it was with Tom Brady and Tom Brady's attitude has never been, I've got to win or, or, or else I'm a failure. It's mm -hmm. that, that's not the, it's not the all or nothing to your point, right? It's, yeah. it's yeah. like, let's do the very best that I can and, and let's set these goals that are really high. Cause if you don't set those goals that are high, you're, it's like, we're going to be able to do what we believe we can do. Yeah, absolutely. The mind is so powerful that it has helped me as an athlete. It has helped me as a business person. Your confidence comes from what you're saying and repetitively um, going about in your head. Like if you're constantly focused on your doubts and your fears and the negativity or what could go wrong, that's what's going to happen. If you flip it and you're constantly focused on the opportunity and the positive aspects and the things that you actually can do, then you're setting yourself up to succeed versus setting yourself up to fail. But your mind controls it all. But we get to control our mind. Yeah. You just got to be able to connect those two and go, oh, wow, okay. It's not that difficult, but yet you can't say it's easy, especially if you're not in the right headspace, especially if you're struggling with stuff. And that's where I feel like you need people who can surround you and help you believe in yourself because then once you get to that point, awesome. Now you can conquer it. But you can't just all of a sudden tell someone, go believe you can be X, Y, and Z and be the CEO of your company. And they're just like, yeah, really? Okay. You got to help. I mean, that's where I feel like for me, I love giving back. I love to help people discover potential they may not even realize they have or give them that support and the encouragement and inspire them to really push and work hard and achieve what they want. But Sometimes you need those cheerleaders around you to, to help you stay focused and believe that you can achieve it to build up your confidence. Well, it's like you, you got to surround yourself with the right people. Mm -hmm. Oh, you yeah. Gotta surround yourself with people that are going to support you and support the things that you want in your life. And mm -hmm. uh, going back to the, the thoughts in our in our mind, I mean, what do they say? We have 60,000 thoughts a day and 90 percent mm -hmm. of them are repetitive. Right. Yep. Oh, yeah. And, I think that those, I think those are the numbers that I, I may be off a little bit, but it's, it's, it's something along those lines. So how do you, 
how do you change your, your mindset or how do you change your thoughts? I mean, cause I'm sure you have negative thoughts that go through your mind. What do you do when you have a negative thought that goes through your mind? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I wouldn't be human if I didn't, but I try to live a positive life every single day and to find the silver lining. But granted, there are moments, there are days where I'm like, man, just can everything stop coming at me? This, it can't get any worse. But I, in those moments where I just feel like things are spinning and things just keep getting worse, the day keeps just kind of diving down, I literally have to take a step back and take some moments to breathe. And as silly as it sounds, literally stepping away, getting some silence, taking some deep breaths. And then I focus on what is working because there's always positive. You can always find some good. But when things are going bad, when you're having a down day, I know for me, that's because all I'm focusing on is the negative or what I'm not getting or what I'm not having or what's not going right in the day. And that will, for me, 100% always continue to make things worse. So it's like, okay, you know, um, for example, this morning, we're getting ready for this. My webcam not working, right? It's like, oh, it's frustrating. The webcam's not working. And then my mic's not working. I'm trying to plug in my AirPods, right? Well, First of all, I have AirPods. I'm lucky that I have that. I'm lucky that I have a laptop that's working. I have backup plans. So it's like you can easily flip your mindset to say, who cares? Who cares the webcam is not working? Don't let it rattle you. Don't let it frustrate you. There's another option. Focus on what's working. Focus on the good that you have. And for me, that always helps. It's like take a step back and just find something good that is working, that's positive. I woke up. I'm healthy today. There's literally the simplest things that you can find. And for me, that helps flip my mindset. So whenever I feel those moments coming on where I'm just kind of like, ugh, today, I notice it. I can recognize the voices in my head. It's like, all right, take control. Take control of the situation. Take control of the day. Bring yourself back into that positive mindset, positive mind frame. And everything then just starts working out. Because let's be honest, our days are filled with negative crap that's thrown at us. But how you respond to it, how you deal with it is what's going to dictate how everything pans out in the end. And if you can laugh about it, if you can joke, if you can be like, wow, today was crazy, even better. You know, it's just it's all in how you perceive it and how you respond to whatever is thrown at you in your environment. Yeah, I think that that kind of speaks to being in gratitude, right? Absolutely. It's like- it's, it's being grateful for everything in my life. And, mm-hmm. and I, I've realized that I have to get to a place where I'm grateful for, for, for everything, whether it's mm-hmm. perceived as negative or positive or, or, or whatever. Like if I perceive something as negative, I, I'm never like, oh, this, you know, I, I had to go to rehab or mm-hmm. I, like whatever ends up, ha- I, I got COVID-19, you got COVID-19 too. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I can, I can, I can feel sorry for myself. I can be a victim right. or right. I can say, you know what? I'm grateful that I've gotten it. I'm healthy. I, I don't have to go to the hospital. I'm still breathing on my own. I feel good. Uh, I can still eat food, although I can't taste it. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. You're like, hmm, food used to be good. Yeah. Right. Right. Now it's purely for nutrition, which is really the purpose anyway <laughs> of it. So, so let's, uh, okay. So let's, let's talk about, um, obstacles and what, okay. So what, how do you deal with obstacles when they're thrown at you? Well, um, it's kind of goes back to the same thing. You've got to focus on how you respond to it. For me as an athlete, um, I've experienced many, many injuries. <laughs> I've had 16 surgeries. I've literally broken almost every bone in my body. And as an athlete competing and traveling the world, injuries can totally kill your career. I mean, they can make you completely be obsolete in the industry depending on the severity of it. So it's always kind of scary. Um, I've had some pretty big ones. I've, I broke my neck. I have a 12 piece metal cage. That, had to surgically be implanted to put my neck back together. I've torn my rotator cuff, labrum, twice over here, twice over here, ACL, MCL, um, literally broken so many things. But with every setback, it was like, okay, it forced me to focus on the positive. So when I blew out my ACL and my MCL, I still had my upper body that I could 
use to function and, you know, continue to do exercise and workouts and even my fitness routine. Um, mm. And the only time I ever skipped a show, a competition was when I had broke my neck. Otherwise, I've almost always competed with something broken. I competed um, on one of the largest stages of our industry with a torn ACL and a full leg brace. I've competed with broken elbows, broken wrists, broken hands. So I don't really know what it's like to step on a huge stage for the biggest show of the year being healthy, <laughs> but it's there was always something I could focus on. So it's like focus on the body parts that work. Um, be as creative as you can and come up with a fitness routine where you can't jump because, you know, for example, my ACL can't do much, but I was able to create a routine that was dynamic, um, that was impressive enough, could trick my leg into doing certain things. So it forces you to kind of think out of the box. But again, it's because I was able to flip it and focus on the positive, to focus on the things that were working in my favor rather than dwelling on what wasn't. Um, I don't like the whole pity party mentality. So if you're, you know, having a hard time, I would notice and it's like, oh, poor me. No, screw that. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Do something about it. Because guess what? You may get someone's sympathy for 30 minutes that you're talking to them and then they're over it. So what is what good does it do you to sit in that pity party mentality and try to get sympathy, try to get people to feel sorry for you? Who cares? Isn't there a better side on the opposite end of the spectrum? Go show people that none of this stuff is going to take you down. You know, that's more impressive. That's more powerful. Don't get sympathy. Get praise from people going, wow, I can't believe you actually did that. That's crazy. You could have sat there and just kind of been like, oh, poor me. I, I hurt myself. I can't do anything. And just use every excuse in the book. But I, I didn't like that mentality. I wanted to be able to be the one who proved everyone wrong saying, oh yeah, you thought my career was over. You thought I was down and out. Mm -mm, I'll show you. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, it's like overcoming adversity, but it's all in how you approach it. It's your perspective. It's being grateful for the opportunities that you have. And it's finding the positive in a horrible situation. So for me, I've experienced it a lot and I love to talk to athletes about this um, and even just a ton of my regular clients, you know, they may sprain their ankle and right now it's, it's January, everyone's on their new year's resolution kit. Well, if you are ready to go and get your health back on track and then you injure yourself, that will derail people from their goals for all of 2021. So I love helping clients realize, look, just, this is a temporary setback. Do not lose sight of all the goals you set for yourself this year to get yourself on track, to get yourself healthy. Focus on this being a temporary setback, but there's still stuff you can do. I mean, depending on your injury, you can still focus on nutrition. You can take stuff to a pool and get some cardio in if you can't have impact. So there's always a way to keep moving forward. You just have to be willing to do it. Amen. So... Let's talk about COVID-19 for a minute because we're in the middle of this supposed pandemic. Um, you've had COVID-19. I've had it. Uh, you've had it. Have you had it? Did I hear you say that you had it twice? Okay. So, yeah. two times. okay so tell me about, I mean, I can tell you about my opinion and, and my experience with it. You tell me about your experience with it. I mean, it was the first time I had it. It was awful. It was the sickest I've ever been, honestly, 104 fever for four straight days. Um, they tested me and they said, you know, you're coming back with, it looks like the flu, but it's not the flu. So this was back in the beginning of last year before COVID was really the thing. But then of course I lost my sense of taste, sense of smell. Um, it progressed really bad. I mean, I was sick for nine weeks straight, turned to pneumonia. I was on an inhaler, but Again, I didn't know COVID at that time, right? So I just assumed it was a bad cold, the, the flu. Um, mm. Then I had it again in June. And June, it wasn't near as bad. I mean, I probably would have never even stayed home from work if it wasn't for COVID, you know? So I'm like, oh, I had a slight fever. Never even went above 100. Um, but lost my sense of taste and smell and all that again. Got the test. And sure enough, it's COVID. But I do believe COVID's a thing. Do I think it's the end all be all and oh my gosh, all these shutdowns and this craziness is warranted? No, that's my opinion. Um, it's 
just like a sickness. You know, again, I don't know if it's that much different than a cold. Now, granted, I have had some issues with my lungs as a result of it because it did get really bad in the first case. But I've also had pneumonia before, and that's not good. But we're not shutting down the whole country because people get pneumonia. So I don't know. I battle with it as a business owner. I've been highly affected by all the restrictions and the shutdowns. And that's where I think for me, I'm kind of like, gosh, this is it's being taken to an extreme. And, um, you know, obviously, I know people are dying from it. By all means, I'm not trying to say this isn't a thing. But unfortunately, I could walk outside right now and be hit by a car. So there's risks with everything. There's a lot that's going on. I just think it's a shame how many people are being distanced from their family. Um, you can't see loved ones in the hospital that are dying, not even COVID related. Businesses that are going under, people who are losing their entire life savings because their businesses have been affected by it. That's where I struggle with what is happening with the whole COVID pandemic. Yeah. And, and I mean, my, like I've, I've talked with lots of people about this and it's a, it's a respiratory virus and it's does not pose a major health risk. That's, mm -hmm. that's my understanding. Um, I think the recovery rate, the last I heard was 99. 97% or something like that. So it's it's very high. And yeah, it's real. I mean, I was I was sick. Um, I had a fever for one night. And then my body was achy and I had a headache. And then my sense of taste and smell, I didn't think I had it. And then and then like two and a half days in, I lost my sense of taste and smell. And I was yeah. like, Oh, crap, I got yeah. it. I'm sure That's I got it. Kicker. <laughs> yeah. And, and, to, and it's just like, if, if we weren't in this COVID-19 environment, then once I started feeling better, I would have gone out in, in, into the world and I would have just been careful and, and not exposed other people to my sickness because I didn't want to get them sick. But because of this, we have to quarantine for 14 days. I waited until I got a clean test back and so forth. So I, I thought it was it was excessive. And it's like, what is the 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 result in, in terms of um, really mental health, addiction, um, isolation, social distancing, yeah. all of those things are, are just, um, I, I think, having a massive impact on on society today. And, and, I agree. and, and okay. it's you know, it's just uh, like, let's let's focus on being healthy, taking care of ourselves and getting enough sleep and ice bath and red light therapy and eating the right foods and all the other things that we can do to, to take care of ourselves, which mm -hmm. leads me to my next question. How do you take care of yourself? Um, I do. I love like the whole self-care movement that's really become popular because I think it's important um, for me. My outlet is exercise, whether it's, you know, each morning I get up and I just um, I have some cardio equipment at home. I do some walking in the morning, just really getting myself mentally ready for the day. Um, I also then work out later in the day. And again, that's kind of my outlet. That's how I take care of myself mentally. And then it's just having some downtime, um, whether it's you know, with my boys at the end of the day, trying to sit and watch some TV, reading. Um, I love massages. And, you know, just having that relaxation where you can take your mind away from, for me, it's away from work because it's constantly, there's always 8 million things I need to do. So being able to just kind of pause, pause my um, life from you know, my phone blowing up nonstop with all these things and my boys needing mom, mom, mom. I need to have a little bit of quiet space for me. So for me, it's something I try to implement at least once a day. Um, some days I'm luckier and can get some more time in, but it's super, super important. And I think mentally it's great because you have to protect your own mindset, your own sanity. So if you're having a rough time, I think that's the cue. That's your indication that you need to take more time to do some self care for yourself. So you're you talked about your morning routine. What is your what is your morning routine? Your normal mor morning routine? Um, I usually I get up usually at four four thirty every day, <laughs> uh. and I go downstairs. I do some cardio just to get my heart pumping. 
um, kind of go through and start planning my day, sit down then at my laptop, hammer out about an hour, hour and a half of work. Then I got to get my boys up, get them head dressed to school. Then I head into work. Um, so I work at my gym and I run all my other businesses out of that. So I work at the gym doing, you know, focusing on my apparel line, working on my um, annual event, my huge fitness competition, training clients. And then, of course, working on um, I train a lot of clients on, online all over the world. So doing their updates, chatting with them, doing their check ins, modifying their programs. And then my boys are busy, busy, busy. So after school, um, one of them every night has at least practice or a game for baseball and football and home then for homework, dinner, relaxation. And then I always do a little work before bed as well. So that's a standard day for me. Isn't, uh, you know, I, I wake up early as well and I don't know about you, but it's, it's, it's the best. It's the best yeah. because my phone's not ringing. People aren't texting me. Nobody's calling me. That's my time when I yeah. get to be alone, when I get to journal, when I get to read, I do my red light. I, um, I do a little workout. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm similar. I just, that time in the morning is, is what I really need to get my day started off on the foot. Now tell me about, um, services that you provide and, and how, like what, what services do you provide? And for anybody listening to the show, if they want to get into health and fitness and um, anything that you, you do, what, what, how can they find you? Tell me a little bit about the services you provide. So I do coaching. Um, the main thing I do is helping anyone and everyone. So there's no limitation. Obviously I do coach athletes who do fitness competitions, but a large part of what I do is just helping people achieve their potential, their highest potential in getting healthy and, and being at their best. So some people it's okay. I need to drop 20 pounds. Others it's, I need to put on some muscle because I'm breaking bones and I'm just withering away. Um, it could be a couple who want to do a little challenge together and, and get their quality of life back. Um, people who are on all these medications for diabetes, blood pressure, anything like that. So it's, it's honestly helping people get back on track with their health. And I do a lot of the online training because I'm in Arizona, but not everyone's in Arizona. So um, I have a huge software portal system where people, it's all communication. Clients check in weekly, they upload their photos. I modify their diets, um, whether they want a custom like meal plan, if they want to follow macros. I do workout programs that are updated every couple of weeks, um, nutrition plans, cardio plans. Um, supplement plan. So all of that just, it's an overall comprehensive approach to health. And then of course, a lot of that involves a lot of the mindset coaching, you know, if they're struggling and they're having a hard time getting motivated, um, what are things that they can do to kind of get up and going? So it's coaching, not just to say, eat this, do this for your workouts. Good luck. It's very in-depth and it's helping all of my clients understand what works for their body. For example, some people can eat a ton of carbs and they never gain weight and other people can eat tons of fats. Some people do great with just a little bit of cardio in the morning versus post-workout. So it's really helping all of my clients troubleshoot to find out what is the best thing for them. How can they be efficient with their workouts? Um, how do they get in workouts when they are traveling all over the country for their jobs or they have kids at home? There's all always obstacles in regards to preventing you from getting into your healthy mindset and having the the healthiest lifestyle. But when you can have someone who helps you overcome those hurdles, that's where it's beneficial. So that's what I do. Um, and then obviously, if you're in Arizona, I have a gym, um, train clients, I have a full staff. So they help train clients in person. But anyone that has any questions or, or is interested um, can email me at fit with Jones, so F I T W H I T Jones J O N E S at gmail.com. And I'd be happy to send information on my programs, pricing, and kind of give you a rundown of like what it is that I do. Okay, so email is it's fit with Jones at gmail.com. Gmail.com. Okay. And then I put your um, website at witjones.com uh, in the comment section as well. And I think that's all the time we have. Uh, Whitney, it was really such so awesome getting to chat with you this morning. 
And I, I sure did learn a lot. And um, thanks so much for, for being here. And I will, I, will be, I will see you soon. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. I hope you guys all are having an amazing week. Make sure you kick off that 2021 on the right foot, baby. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day.